or guidelines. Uh, you want a group of surgeons, uh, interventional cardiologists, uh, non-interventional uh, cardiologists, and other practitioners involved in the care of patients that need coronary revascularization. So you want a good mix. Now you have statisticians involved, and lately you've wanted, uh, they include a lay person to kind of take a different perspective uh, on uh, the recommendations uh, they, uh, they make. You want a good distribution of uh, e uh, economic and uh, uh, racial uh, background. So you cover uh, all the patients in the particular uh, area, in our case, uh, North America. In addition, you have various societies involved. Uh, for this, you have the Society of uh, Coronary Angiography and Intervention, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, and uh, the American Association for Thoracic Surgeon, in addition to the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association. So you have a, a good uh, buy-in from all the different uh, groups. Uh, so you have uh, more support and, and relevance to the, to the guidelines. So how's the process work? Well, about two or two and a half years before the guideline is published, all the committee members meet, usually in Dallas, uh, they're given their assignments on which uh, areas they're supposed to investigate. And uh, you have to come up with all the recent, usually within the last 10 years, the, the clinical trials or other uh, reports that uh, deal with this particular clinical area. For mine was ventricular septal defects, uh, non-ST segment uh, myocardial infarction revascularization with uh, the surgical approach and uh, STEMI. Uh, uh, treatment with uh, coronary vascularization. And like I said, they meet every week for two hours. So, you know, two, two years, two hours a week, that's 200 hours. So you're putting roughly 250 hours into this process. So there's a lot of thought to put into this. And a simple majority when you vote on the guidelines is what carries that particular recommendation. Uh, a lot of these is the unanimous uh, vote for approving the guidelines. Uh, for some of these, it came down to a 12 to 7 vote or 11 to 9 vote. So if that's the case, uh, in the text of the guidelines, you generally put in that there was some disagreement and the reason for that disagreement. So this is uh, the class of recommendations, the level of evidence. I was on the clinical guidelines task force uh, about five or six years ago for a couple uh, years. And that task force reviews all the guidelines coming from the ACC and the AHA mm -hmm. to make sure the methodology is correct, sometimes to uh, uh, revise how the uh, guidelines are organized and written. And uh, when I started, there was just three recommendations, one, two, and three. One is you should do it. Two, you probably should do it, and three, you shouldn't do it. Well, there's a little bit more granularity added. Uh, so one is definitely you should do it. And then they had 2A says, yeah, there's pretty good evidence that uh, this is a good thing. 2B is, yeah, it's, it's, it's probably a good thing, but uh, it, it may not be in all cases. And for three, he says, yeah, you can do it, but it doesn't do any good. And then the other one is, uh, it's the three, but it actually causes harm. So you definitely should not do it. With the level of evidence, uh, level A is multiple randomized clinical trials. That's really the gold standard. And again, for level B, where there's non-randomized uh, trials, uh, they were split up into the randomized uh, trials that didn't really support the recommendation that strongly, and then non-randomized trials. So again, a little bit more granularity. And for level C, it's LD, limited data. Yeah, there's some data to support this. And uh, C, uh, expert opinion, EO. And it's amazing uh, how many things that we do that are level one, but uh, level of evidence C. So it's like jumping out of an airplane from 10,000 feet with or without a parachute. Well, nobody's gonna do a trial to look at that, but we know what the answer is. So how's the process work? Well, after the guidelines are completed, again, this is about a, a two-year process. It's initially reviewed by the, the clinical guidelines task force and sent out for peer review. And then it comes back, the uh, uh, writing committee uh, revises the guidelines. It's once again sent out uh, for review, comes back, it's revised again. And for each of the recommendations, the writing committee has to vote, as I mentioned before. And again, it's just the majority vote that determines whether this guideline is accepted. 
it's sent to the uh, other sponsoring organizations. Uh, for example, the uh, Society of Thoracic Surgeons and the AATS, and then the officers, the ACC and AHA signed off on it. Well, so what are the, the 10 take home points? Well, there, some of these are pretty straightforward that uh, patients with uh, coronary uh, artery disease uh, should be treated based on uh, indications regardless of sex, race, or ethnicity. Uh, this is the first time this made it into the guidelines. Two, patients being considered for coronary vascularization in whom optimal uh, therapy is not uh, known. You should have a, a heart team approach. So there should be some uh, discussion about this. For patients with significant left main disease, surgical revascularization is indicated to improve survival. Now, this has uh, been known since the CAS study uh, for about 40 or 50 years. And percutaneous intervention is a reasonable option for left main disease. So the patient is a not a good uh, surgical candidate. Now, there are certain areas, uh, Japan, uh, uh, South Korea, where uh, there's a lot of left main PCI performed and the results tend to be very good, especially for uh, non-complicated left main disease. That's a, a perfectly acceptable treatment. Um, number four, the updated evidence from contemporary trials, supplemented older evidence with regard to mortality of benefit for revascularization in stable patients with normal left ventricular function. This is not what Dr. Uh, uh, Old Boyd uh, was talking about. This is stable angina with normal left ventricular function. The level of evidence was a one uh, it went down to a 2B, and this is one of the areas of controversy. Uh, also, a PCI ended up being a 2B, so I'll get into that. The use of a radial artery for surgical revascularization uh, was preferred, and this went to a uh, 1A recommendation. Now, this is a, a meta-analysis by friend uh, Mario Godino. Yes, there's an advantage to using the radial artery, but only about 5% of patients in the United States that get a surgical revascularization get the radial artery. And the reason for this, the, the data is still somewhat not conclusive. Uh, patients that are older than the age of 75 have diabetes, renal insufficiency, reduced ejection fraction. From this meta-analysis, do not benefit from a radial artery. And because uh, the STS and the AATS uh, did not feel that uh, this deserve a level one recommendation, they withdrew their support. Number six, radial artery access. I think it's pretty straightforward and people uh, have less complications, so that's a good thing. Short duration of dual antiplatelet therapy. Uh, if patients are doing well, you can stop the aspirin and continue the uh, uh, clopidogrel or the uh, ticagrelor after about uh, three months, you know, if they have a high risk for bleeding. Staged uh, percutaneous intervention. If somebody comes in uh, with a STEMI, uh, you open the affected artery, and if they're stable uh, or have other critical disease, you may be able to do a PCI at that time, but if the patient's in cardiogenic shock, you only treat the affected artery. You do not do any additional intervention. Number nine, uh, patients with uh, diabetes and multivessel disease. Again, a heart team approach should be uh, performed. I think there's pretty good evidence that uh, surgery is better than PCI, but that's a surgeon's uh, perspective. This was another area of controversy. And treatment decisions for patients undergoing surgical revascularization should include a calculation of the STS risk score. And there's kind of a downplay of the syntax score calculation uh, for PCI because of a lot of variability. So with the area of controversy, the AATS and the SDS had three concerns, the downgrading of coronary bypass grafting and treatment of three vestal disease. They wanted it to maintain a one. I thought it should be a 2A, it went to a 2B. Um, the um, lack of recognition of superior long-term benefits of cabbage versus PCI in, in decreasing repeat inter re intervention and post-procedural myocardial infarctions. Uh, this was actually addressed in the text. Uh, so if you just read the, the recommendations, you may not pick this up. If you read the text, it explains that. And rewarding, awarding a class uh, one recommendation, radial artery condet, they thought should be a 2A, it made it a one. Uh, so in summary, the ACC and AHA guidelines are a model of clinical guidelines as commented on by the National Academy of Medicine. A tremendous amount of work by a large number of clinicians, both 
surgeons, interventional cardiologists, and non-interventional cardiologists goes to the end of the creation of these guidelines. These uh, debates are held uh, weekly for two years, and a lot of thought goes into these. And there is a consensus on most of the recommendations. There's hundreds of recommendations, and they disagreed on three, but they, because of the strength of their disagreement, they pull their support away. So there is an ongoing uh, movement now to reevaluate this, these things, uh, and I would agree with that. So in summary, these guidelines provide recommendations applicable to patients with or at risk for developing cardiovascular disease. They are intended to define practice meeting the needs of patients in most, but not all circumstances, but they should not replace clinical judgment. Example, patient gets a uh, cardiac catheterization as normal ejection fraction and has 60 or 70% lesions, three vessel disease. I would not recommend surgery in this patient or PCI. We recommend optimal medical therapy. If somebody has uh, stable angina, but critical anatomy, I would recommend surgery. So it, the guidelines do not take the place of common sense and good clinical practice. So again, I would like to thank you for your attention and your kind invitation. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm here to if, Okay, sir, if anybody I'm, questions uh, to sir, can I, can I ask you one question? <laughs> I know there are a lot of diversified papers before uh, let it go in a stream. So, I mean, uh, I have one question for you before I'm too late to ask. The question is, um, the recommendation that you have shown and 2000, uh, 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 2021 recommendation, 10 recommendations are very uh, useful for the surgeon. I was just wondering why bilateral internal memory artery used in USA is so less? Uh, it's number one, somewhat less convenient than just doing the uh, single memory. And the data supporting that a lot of surgeons feel is not conclusive. Again, look at the arterial re revascularization trial. Uh, it didn't show any benefit. Now the Roma trial, I think is gonna go a long way in providing guidance on, should we use two mammary arteries or should we use one? And that, that's, that's the main reason for that. I know Mario Godino very well. He's a good friend of mine. He's, he's uh, running this trial and part of the trial. Um, so we'll just see, but I, I know internationally, there's more utilization of bilateral mammary arteries. Um, and there's a movement to use the skeletonized mammary arteries. But there was also a couple of papers that retrospectively looked at that. The, the uh, arterial vascularization got, trial showed that the patency of the right internal mammary artery was very poor, even worse than the saphitous vein. So there's still some controversy. And that, you know, putting all this together, that's the reason there's not more utilization of bilateral mammary arteries. But see, this recommendation that I read in 2001, what you have shown, there it has been said that bilateral the artery for centers who are newly doing, and centers they are doing for a long time, the re results are different. So what I believe, uh, uh, some centers of India and also in our center, we use about 35% of the total cases of bilateral internal memory arteries, 35%. So that's uh, pretty good. I mean, uh, but uh, then again, we have done bilateral internal memory artery in situ graft and also in Y grafts. The results are similar. And, you know, taking skeletonized memory artery, skeletonized memory artery grafting has not given any adverse effect so far the uh, sternal wood dehiscence or infection. So any comment? Yeah, actually markedly reduced the incidence of sternal wound infection, but from these two trials, one was the COMPASS trial and the other was the arterial vascularization trial. They retrospectively look at this and they found that the patency of the right internal memory artery was poor. It was, it was worse than the radial artery and actually worse than the saphenous vein. In these two trials, in the retrospective analysis, but this is a retrospective analysis from a prospective clinical trial. That's not a gold standard. The Roma trial is a prospective randomized trial. That should help give us the answer. And I like your first comment. Turn to uh, uh, feasibility or his access or his uh, easiness of doing. Um, yes. Wants, like, well, if, if people thought that there was a, a definitive improvement in outcomes, we would be doing bilateral memories on everybody.
Uh, but there's still some uncertainty there by most surgeons. Thank you very much. Frank had come to National Heart Foundation in 2002 when I was doing surgery. And he came to our center also and visited my theater. That's a very big thing. And also, he's an editor of Sabistan. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now, I welcome our second speaker, Dr. Ashraful Aksiam. Uh, he has to a TABI program in his uh, in NIT, NICBD. So, I welcome uh, Dr. Ashraful Aksiam to deliver his speech, his talk about MICS multivessel CABG surgical challenges. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be here to present my topics in front of the learned panelists and the audience. Welcome to all. I will start my topics by showing this slide. Don't limit your challenge. Challenge your limits. My topics is MICS multivessel CBG surgical challenges. This is the picture of the beginning journey of cardiac surgery. We faced a lot of challenges. Now in Bangladesh, we are here right now. We are doing the minimal invasive car cardiac surgery, including the multivessel CVG. This is the one and only government cardiovascular institute in Bangladesh, the National Institute of Cardiovascular Disease. It, it is one of the biggest cardiac hospital is South Asia. Now it has the 1250 bedded hospital. All of we know the first CBG was held in NICBD in first uh, in 1990 at NICBD. In early days, we have some dreams. Our teachers and professor they saw some dream in early days to establishment of regular safe cardiac surgery to reach most of the people in need of cardiac surgery, advancement of cardiac surgery from simple to complex and from pump case to beating us surgery. Now, the surgical challenges in a multivessel cabbage is there are any unexpected or specific obstacles associated with the MICS procedures. When I started uh, the uh, MICS cabbage, there are some myths regarding MICS multivessel CVG. These are, is complete arterial revascularization possible? Is MICS suddenly an option for the conventional method? Do the difference really matter? Conversion to conventional method, acceptability among the cardiologist friends, which I am not doing, isn't the reality. Uh, I face some common challenges. The number one is exposure problem and limited excess. Number two is the lima harvesting. Number three is proximal anastomosis. Number four, distal anastomosis. Number five, intolerance for single lung ventilation and with some anesthetics problems. Before my incision, I always try to think something that it should be double lumen ET tube for the single uh, lung ventilations. On the left side, uh, always I try to do the CBP and radial lines, all lines to the left side, and I ensure external defibrillator paired, left chest, and the position of the patient is 30 degree, left arm below and of course, the MICS instruments. And leave sternal excess due to, if we needed the emergency uh, sternotomy for that reason, we leave sternal excess, leave femoral excess, emergency purpose of fam, -fam bypass. And always I do mark the incision and landmarks. 
approach i uh, always uh, uh, approaches for the mid cap is uh, uh, standard mid cap the left anterior lateral thoracotomy is 4 to 5 uh, intercostal space i always try to correlate with the x ray and g foot approach the key points is proper positioning is important semi right lateral decubitus position with the left arm extended avoid any traction to prevent brachial plexus injury higher excess roots can impair exposure when performing R rca systems surgeon should be flexible if needing to change the intercostal space to one space above or below all through the same skin incision during lima harvesting i always try to position the thorax track with uh, positioning of the the thorax track with the blade incision should be planned according to the x-ray during incision thorax track retractor blade are care should be taken not to point it towards the right shoulder rather it should point more towards the mid left mid clavicular line to prevent lima injury lima may not be visualized as whole better to start where it is seen more prominent during the proximal anastomosis uh, uh, before the ot i always try to uh, do a chest x-ray and ct autogram to uh, for aortic plaque or calcification if the uh, there is any pl uh, plaque or calcified aorta then i try to avoid then sufficient retraction of the pericardium near the ascending aorta then uh, I, a, aorto pulmonary group freeing of aorto pulmonary group and gauge placement at the right side of the aorta near the appendage to uh, 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 avoid any injury of the uh, appendix one ceiling in aorto pulmonary group near the proximal ascending aorta and traction towards the feet vascular clamping can further retract the ascending aorta towards the feet i always try to uh, use the normal uh, uh, partial clamp and of course the long instruments during distal uh, uh, anastomosis uh, enhancing our exposure uh, pericardiotomy should be t-shaped and deep i always uh, try to do uh, take some deep pericardial stitch and stabilization device during LAD or, or d1 grafting I uh, take deep pericardial suture towards the left and gauge piece to lift the heart. Here is uh, some pictures. And uh, during uh, OM uh, uh, grafting, there uh, I take uh, deep pericardial suture to left shoulder, free the right pericardial suture. Handling the heart for selecting the grafting site can be done safely with two peanuts. And during PDA, uh, I uh, uh, always do use uh, the handling the heart for uh, the same way with two pinners, free the left pericardial suture and deep pericardial suture towards the feet. Now, the key point is the distal anastomosis exposure relies upon pericardial retraction and the use of tissue stabilizer. Handling the heart for selecting the grafting site can be done safely with two pinners to expose the vessel on the inferior surface the heart is suspended towards the left shoulder and to the lateral surface towards the right hip for easy and better exposure of the left territory during anastomosis the left pericardial ceilings are tightened and the right ones are loosed and vice versa now the keep in mind the law of, law of conversion of torture. The total amount of torture involved in an operation is constant. Thus, the reduction in patient discomfort by minimal invasive techniques must be accompanied by an equal and opposite increase in discomfort felt by the operating surgeons. All of you know that minimal invasive cardiac surgery transfers the pain of surgery from the patient to the surgeon. We, all of you know there are some benefits of uh, multivessel cabbage through MICS. It's best, better cosmosis, faster recovery, no sternal complications, less hospital stay, less invasive, and patient satisfactions. Here, 
we uh, can see uh, the one case. Uh, this is the angiographic view. Uh, uh, diagnosis is uh, coronary artery disease, TVD. My plan was uh, I, I, I will give uh, four graphs, but in Phil, I went for mini cabbage. I did Lima Chiality, RSBG sequential to Ramas, and PDA. Total three graphs we have given in this case. And this is the patient picture. There is the same, the second case. Uh, second case. This is the angiographic view of the patients. Uh, we did Lima Triality, RSBG sequential to diagonal one and PDA. And another, this is the third case. This is the angiographic view. The patient was diabetic and presented with uh, chronic stable angina. And he here we can see we are uh, doing the proximal anastomosis, then the flow of the proximal. Then uh, we are uh, giving the lima to a lady. And RS visit sequential to WEM1 and PDA. There are the total three graphs we have uh, given uh, through beating heart. This is the picture of the patients, the after procedure of the three patients through mini CVG with uh, three graphs, multivessel CVG. Now, there are a lot of journal published in worldwide. We can see uh, that it is safe as op cap, shorter hospital, length of stay, faster postoperative physical recovery. The uh, Oxford uh, Academy Journal, they also said MICS CBG has a significantly better long term survival than standard to CBG. Uh, you uh, know the picture. In this picture, we can see the uh, more popular character in uh, the movie, the Shifu and the Panda. One day, Panda said, You set me up to fail. Why? Then the Shifu said, if you only do what you can do, you will never be more than you are now. Same is here. If the, our professor and our uh, teachers are not started the cabbage or heart surgery in Bangladesh, we will be not here just right now. And for that reason, we always thankful to Professor Farooq Ahmed, Professor Jahangir Kobir, Nobi Alam Sar, Esar Khan Sar. We always thankful to them. For their reason, we are here. Now, some scenario of our team is the current situation. Uh, my team, we are doing the bulk cases is 40% to uh, 90%. DVR is we are doing 40%, and MBR is 90% cases. We are doing the minimal invasive. Uh, ASD second up 95% uh, cases. We are doing the minimal invasive and cabbage multivessel CVG 70% cases. We are doing just right now. I always believe that challenges make you more responsible. Always remember that life without struggle is a life without success. Don't give up and learn not to quit. Now, my take home message is MICS multivessel cabbage is technically challenging. Decision making is the key. Surgical challenges can be tackled by the development of expertise through experience. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Rashtrapul Aksiyam. Any questions to our speaker? Any questions from audience? Chair, uh, balance. Uh, Dr. Siam, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. We are proud to be here as NICVD at a government sector. We started our MICS and then we started it. Thank you very much and congratulations. But my question is here you are doing MICS prior you started open and sternotomy. Do you feel which one is better? MIC is undoubtedly very uh, favorable for the patients because nobody wants to cut the sternum. But as a surgeon, how do you feel and you feel comfort 
to go for open standard to be or MICS, number one. And number two, is it mandatory to go for CT autogum for proximal anastomosis in MICS? And how, how much you feel comfort to go for the proximal RCA or mid, mid RCA to go for MICS or open standard to be? Thank you, sir. The first thing is definitely open is comfortable than minimal invasive multivessel cabbage. If you see that, then I, I saw a slide then minimal invasive surgery, the pain shifted from patient to the surgeon. And uh, during, uh, at first, our journey, we are st uh, first uh, started a mini uh, uh, MICS uh, cases through ASD, then valve cases. Now we are doing the multivessel uh, uh, cabbage. When our previous teachers and professors are started cabbage in Bangladesh, then that was some struggle, that was some uh, challenges. Nowadays, we are doing the right and left uh, cabbage in Bangladesh. So we just, uh, in the situation to take off our flight, we are doing uh, regularly. I think one day it will be like that uh, in open cabbage is like that diamonds. CBG. And yeah, your another question is uh, uh, for the CT autogram. Yes, uh, sometimes uh, I have done the CT uh, autogram, but now I uh, doing the routine protocol because uh, if we do uh, go through the mini uh, uh, cabbage, if the aorta uh, uh, is uh, 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 calcified. I see the aorta is calcified, then I avoid uh, to mini. I am go through the uh, sternotomy. And uh, I uh, never felt, uh, because if I uh, do the uh, uh, pro proximal anastomosis is another challenging. If we uh, do the proximal anastomosis uh, through you, the long length uh, RSBG, then it's uh, approachable to the PD and distal RCA, but depends on Incision. The incision is very vital mark. Um, I always try to oh, give the incision a little bit lower. That is, I always try to correlate with the X-ray, and it, it may be fourth or, or fifth space, and it depends on the size of the heart. If the heart is uh, uh, is okay and correlate with the uh, X-ray, then it will be better, and always I reach to. PD and distal RC. Thank you, Siam. Thank you very much for your nice answer. Uh, my request to you, is there any uh, incidents happen in your surgery? You have started MICS, then shifted open sternotomy. Uh, yes, um, I uh, convert uh, one cases maybe. Already we have done uh, 100 plus multivessel cabbage. But I already only one uh, case I convert to uh, open cases from mini to uh, ca uh, open uh, cases because there are a lot of addition. It's too much adhesive because I I I, I don't know if the patient was very uh, healthy and age was uh, around 40 to 42 years. And there is no uh, uh, well-known disease. There is no COVID infection. But when I, I uh, in, in incision, uh, in but I can't go through the mini. Then I, I, I convert it. Uh, conversion Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, as a cardiologist, I must uh, congratulate uh, Dr. Siam for his uh, challenging uh, job against the conventional uh, methods. Uh, I want to know, uh, actually we face a lot of problems, in, in, uh, particularly sternotomy cases, uh, ugly scar, keloid formations, and sometimes wound dehiscence, wound infection. So I think uh, we must uh, encourage you. And uh, what is your experience regarding uh, keloid formation and uh, scar tissue formation in MICS? No, and no. I want to uh, hear something from our senior cardiac surgeons regarding this method also. I, I I have uh, not uh, that type of experience in because there is a sub memory incision, so I can't find any keloid 
uh, in the uh, anterolateral uh, thoracotomy. It's, it's a small incision around two and a half inch or three inch. That means it's a five cm or six cm incision. This operation is a real technical tour, tour de force. It's really mastered it. Do you have any uh, outcomes data, like length of stay and mortality? Sorry. Any outcomes data like mortality or length of hospital stay? Um, hospital stay is three to five days maximum. And uh, there is uh, not um, uh, is uh, mortality in uh, 120 cases. I never find any mortality through the in and multi vessel sewage. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yes. Ashapal. I think somebody asked about the killer. Is it a genetic problem? Who will have it? He will have it. I mean, uh, the external uh, problem. But the question is, uh, uh, minimally invasive has come up, gradually coming up globally, and it will take its own place. So uh, uh, one thing is there, that uh, when we used to do uh, on-pump CABG uh, and uh, shifted to the beating heart, the number of graft beating heart declined. And then, uh, over the time, you must have seen that uh, on beating heart, we could graft more than on pump. There are many uh, issues or many reasons. I don't want to go in that. But uh, any technical new something coming up, people initially don't like to adapt it. But gradually, gradually, they adapt it. So uh, I would say that any uh, new intervention we should accept with our open heartly. And uh, that should be that. That should be a good uh, reason for coming up and uh, you know establish uh, procedures. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody. Now I request our next speaker, uh, Professor Kamrul Islam Talukdar, sir, from National Heart Foundation Hospital and Research Institute. His talk regarding repair or replacement of tricuspid valve for abyssinian anomaly. Assalamu alaikum and a very uh, good mo good afternoon. Welcome all to my to, to my presentation. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, not very less very l common uh, cardiac problems. The Ebstein anomaly. Uh, it usually involves the congenital anomaly. I should say that involve uh, tricuspid valve and the right ventricle and the Age of presentation of this group of patients depends on the severity of the malformation. And a good number of uh, patients usually presents in adulthood. And uh, many of the surgeons, uh, you know, doesn't like to address this uh, group of patients. But if they are addressed with appropriate surgical procedures, this patient might have a very good functional life. Um, with this, I will just uh, uh, present my uh, uh, topic uh, as uh, to express my experience in, in this hospital with our adult cardiac surgical team. As you all know, the Ebstein anomaly uh, has got some characteristics like the adherence of the tricuspid valve leaflets. As you can see in the pictures, there are varying degree of attachment of the leaflets with the right ventricle wall with different kinds of gores and muscle, muscle bands. And then the next, second anomaly is the shift of the functional tricuspid annulus from the true tricuspid annulus towards the apex. And that leaves a very large atrialized ventricle. Uh, that portion becomes dilated and dysfunctional that hampers the right uh, ventricular function. Uh, there is a redundancy and frustration of the and tethering of the anterior leaflets, dilatation of the true tricuspid annulus, and variable ventricular myocardial dysfunction. The Wistein anomaly is a rare complex congenital heart disease accounted less than 1% involving the tricuspid valve and uh, right ventricle, as I said. Uh, first described by Wilhelm and Wistein in 1866, 
first successful replacement was done in 1963 by Barnard and Sherry. It represented ongoing challenge since its initial repair attempting in 1958 by Hunter and Lilhay. But thereafter, decades, many surgeons tried to repair this valve with inconsistent result. Finally, Dr. Jose Pedro da Silva, a great innovative surgeon from San Paulo, Brazil, he presented a series with a new technique of cone repair with the tricuspid valve in 86th meeting of AATS in 2006. The cone repair is closest to the anatomical repair in the sense that includes the 60 degree of tricuspid leaflet tissue surrounding right ventricular junction. Reconstruction of the RV uh, tricuspid valve is reattached to the true tricuspid annulus. Plication of the right ventricle removes the, any area of right ventricular dyskinesia. Redundant right atrium is excised to almost normal right atrial size. Cone reconstruction restores the appearance of normal tricuspid anatomy and functional more than any previously described technique. Who are the patients that should be addressed with surgical intervention? Like the indications are NYHA class, functional class 3, 4, and heart failure. The patient with cyanosis, uh, saturation is less than 90% is room air, paradoxical embolization, progressive cardiomegaly, CD ratio is more than 0.60, Progressive RV enlargement on echocardiogram, onset of progressive of arrhythmia. There are others relative contraindications, but these patients can be well addressed with surgery with appreciable results. I will just point out some of the important uh, points uh, regarding the repair, uh, cone repair. Uh, the mainstay of becoming successful to repair this valve is you know the freeing the valves remaining valves which are attached to the venti uh, right right ventricle detaching from the functional uh, tricuspid annulus and detaching from the ventricle wall cutting the cords and the muscle bands until the tricuspid uh, distal cords maximum you know part of the anterior leaflet posterior leaflet and the septal leaflet are mobilized properly. Now the cone is produced by suturing the detached margin of the septal leaflet and posterior leaflet. Here you can see in the picture together to form the cone like this. Now the next step is to reduction of the uh, or plication of the atrial right ventricle, uh, this dis dysfunctional right ventricle like a uh, triangle, apex is towards the apex and base towards the uh, true tricuspid annulus. So this uh, restore the normal geometry of the right ventricle. Now the dilated tri true tricuspid annulus is reduced by multiple uh, interrupted sutures to appropriate size of the base of the cone. The base of the cone is now reattached to the newly formed true tricuspid annulus, avoiding injury to the conduction apparatus. And with the finally, it is tested to the saline and sees that is good cooptation, we keep it. Replacement of tricuspid valve is very easy as like as any other valve like at aortic or mitral, keeping this point in mind that the valve should be tissue valve and we should always try to avoid the injuring the uh, conduction apparatus, especially the AV node. And the orientation of the struts of the valves should be like this, not to obstruct the outflow tract. The result was, came out to be very successful since uh, Dr. Da Silva, who presented his first 100 cases very successfully in Semin Thoracic Cardiovascular Surgery Journal in 2012. Hospital mortality is only 1%, no tricuspid replacement, good anatomic and functional tricuspid valve at immediate and long-term follow-up. Uh, now, the comparing the replacement and repairing of the tricuspid valve, the Mayo Clinic 
reported their large series 539 patient in the journal of thoracic and cardiovascular surgery in 2008 they compared the replacement and repair of tricuspid valve and they found in 10 years survival is in 84 percent now this graph shows that the survival benefit was better in a patient under 12 years with repair group whether the survival benefit was not that good as like as repair with replacement but when the group of the patient has more than 12 years the survival benefit is equal without any statistical difference between the two groups now as for our experience we started our program in 2014 and uh, we're still continuing we reported our um, short um, you know series in 21 cases and uh, that was published in the heart surgery forum 2022 a number of the patient was 21 uh, follow up period was 1 to 6 years uh, successful repair we could do in 12 cases we had to replace the valve in nine cases were three cases due to failed repair and uh, another six patient we had to do uh, replace the uh, valve primarily early death is one and late death was none reintervention there was no reintervention uh, in the follow up period we followed the patient with clinical uh, improvement you can see uh, the clinical improvement in nyh which was before operation uh, class 3 that improved to almost class 1 in every cases and the uh, echocardiographic uh, parameters like tricuspid regurgitation rv function and tapsi that also improved significantly in the follow up period when you compare these two groups the repair and replacement we could find that the there was no statistical difference between the two group in the functional or in the uh uh echocardiogram uh, parameters like tricuspid regurgitation tricus uh, right ventricular function or tapsi with the, with this short experience we like to conclude or opine that the cone repair is an established reproducible technique for epstein anomaly with good long term outcome both in children and in adults the repairable valves may be replaced with tissue valves with long term good results in adults but not in children thank you for patient sharing thank you sir thank you any question or comments to the our speaker right. uh, excellent presentation I... anyway <clears throat> now uh, kamal that has been uh, adult epstein anomaly sir uh, what is your experience with uh, uh, since it is adult one and a half ventricle repair for for uh, uh, epstein uh, i think in adults it's not required because the severity of the disease is not that much i have already said that the age of presentation usually depends on the severity of the disease usually they present in childhood and they require the one and a half ventricle repair the reason i'm saying that one and a half ventricle repair when the rv right ventricle even if you like it and uh, you don't uh, come off bypass that scenario do you have an experience uh, as we uh, as you might have seen we have done a one and a half ventricle repair in this hospital earlier no i, I didn't face any problem coming up from the bypass after you know repairing or replacement okay. of the tricuspid valve yes. uh, we lost on the patient because of right heart failure with the replacement of the valve because you know you took a lot of time in the bypass probably that deteriorated the right ventricular function further so we could not save the patient post operatively otherwise all the patient recovered very well and you have already shown that after operation the follow up they improved functionally and also with echographic echographic uh, parameters that's good um, and uh, one thing in replacing the valve now early days uh, people have any experience any comment about top hat repair top hat repair for mitral valve I don't have any. No, that's uh, putting a valve in a scaffold so that you make more RV volume, top hat repair. That's uh, 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 any comment anyway. 
No, Thank we, you. We already know, you know, that we take up the, all the, you know, septal leaflets, you know, putting a cone and then attached with the true track as annulus. So when, you know, that way the ventricular volume is improved, you know, and of the dysfunctional part, we already apply it. So there is less dysfunction of the RV. So in that way, you know, cone repair or removing the or replacing the tricuspid valve with application of the dysfunctional RV, atrialis RV, it improves the right ventricular function. Definitely. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now I welcome our next speaker, uh, Dr. Harun Rashid from National Heart Foundation Hospital and Research Institute. He will talk mitral valve uh, repair our results. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon to everybody. Just before the lunch session, this speak, uh, speeches has to be shortened because everyone is waiting eagerly for the end of the session. And my next speaker will be Shakil Farid, who is having some technical difficulties for which we had to arrange, rearrange the order. I'm here to talk about the mitral valve repair. It is something that is very well established in most of the part of the world. But we are here to t talk about our results. I am grateful for the organ uh, to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk here. I have nothing, no conflict of interest. I am here to tell our story. When I started my journey to become a cardiac surgeon almost 24 years ago, it was full of passion and dream of a very exciting future. We saw the transition of laparoscopic surgery and how it transformed the surgical fraternity. We came to the cardiac surgery with the hope of transforming it as well. What attracted me to the heart valve surgeries? Because in NICVD those days, valve surgery was the cardiac surgery. And most of our surgeons were very good at replacing the valve. Rheumatic heart disease was common and still common in this country. Valve surgery was very simple in that case. We go to the pump, we arrest the heart, we expose the valve, we excise the valve, size the valve and replace it. We knew repair is a possibility, but that really didn't bother us, but we, we never even attempted a repair. Then it all changed. We had a visit from Shampud Kumar sir, the then head of the department of AIMS. And he introduced us the thought of repairing a rheumatic valve. The very thought was a challenge for us, an eye opener for us. And that actually had intrigued me to do what, uh, uh, think about repair. Over the years, mitral repair rather than replacement, has become a preferred choice. SEC AHA guideline, you have all heard about these things and know about these things, that repair is preferred, provided a good, durable repair is possible. But still, it was thought that rheumatic heart disease is too difficult to do a repair, and it will not be durable. The no long-term result will be very bad. So repair was actually brushed aside, and replacement was the norm. Nowadays, mitral valve replace, repair has established itself as pr procedure of choice for insufficiencies and some cases of stenosis as well. But in our countries, the insufficiencies pathologies is mostly ischemic, which is actually different pathology. It's not a valvular pathology. It's actually LV pathology. Rheumatic, degenerative, congenital, infective, and myxomatous, etc. But we still have a lot of insufficiency patients referred to us for surgery. Most data about repair is from Western data, Western population, where degenerative disease is the most common thing. But in our case scenarios, the rheumatic pathology is still predominant. Ischemic MR is considered separately because it is actually an LV valve disease. Long-term outcome 
outcome is significantly better in replacement uh, than replacement if we do a repair. But these data are of elderly people where their level of education is better, they're health conscious and well to do. Our perspective is different, significantly different. The significant proportion of mitral of disease in our pathology portion of the world is still rheumatic. And rheumatic heart disease is still repairable, though it is technically more difficult, but not impossible. I repeat, it is not impossible. The global rheumatic heart disease studies showed that rheumatic patients, heart disease patients are young, majority are female, and has multivalvular disease complicated by CCF. Majority of MSs and MR, when presented to the surgeon, are in moderate to severe case, late presentation, making repair more challenging. Generally, these patients are young, economy, economically compromised, and le less health conscious. So our challenge is lower health, health education of our population, poor socioeconomic condition, younger patient, late presentation, arrhythmias, but these are the patients that we are dealing with. So our approach is Heart Foundation was, we learn from the experts who were doing repair in rheumatic heart disease patients. We then, we gradually had to accept that it is possible. Then we invited the experts to here, come here and demonstrate it with our patients in our institute that it is possible. Then we started slowly with easy cases, but slowly but surely moving along with doing more and more complex cases with gr growing confidence. We try to preserve the valve and if needed, if the repair is not possible, if it is indicated, we go for bioprosthesis. We don't have, we want to avoid the anticoagulation at any cost, if it's possible. Our approach, I'm going to show our approach. We still do the sternotomy, uh, full sternotomy, superior transeptal approach. We approach the mitral valve as this gives the best approach exposure. Our aim is to learn the MICS, like Siam has said, to use in mitral valve surgeries because patients prefer lesser invasive things. We are using MICS for mitral valve replacements, but not repair yet. At the very early stages of our repair program, we had the opportunity to participate in a prospective multicenter studies sponsored by Madronic, which was a preserved mitral study designed to see the results of mitral repair in this subcontinent. It was assumed that most of these patients will be rheumatic heart disease patients. Thus, it will address the issue of repairability and durability. Data were recorded in a dedicated online registry. I would encourage my seniors and junior colleagues here. I'm, I'm sure there are more gifted surgeons here. Try to be part of this ongoing data, uh, ongoing studies. Present your data, keep your data. Only then you will see how good you are or you can compare your results with others. In that study, we enrolled 200 patients from 10 centers, eight from India, one from Bangladesh, and one from Nepal. We had 26 patients in that registry, among third highest amongst the participant centers. Most of our patients were rheumatic. This data is being ready for, for publications. Now I'm talking about our own experience. From 2005, we started doing repairs by our own team. We had done around 163 repairs in total, but of those, only 116 will be discussed here, which were pure MRs. Pure MR, MR with AVR, MR with tricuspid repair as well. Male, female, we had almost 50-50, equal numbers of male, females. Most of our patients were in the 50 to 30, 30 to 50 age group, followed by less than 30 and very few, or more than 50 patients. We did complete ring annual plastics as bands and other things were not available here. The choice of ring was actually 
dependent on availability. As we were doing, the, we were the only center in the country doing repair at the time. The availability of the proper size of the ring was a real big issue. At the same time, availability of the Gore-Tex sutures and other things, T was an issue. We had done all sorts of techniques uh, where it is net needed. Uh, caudal release, caudal splitting, new uh, 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 placement, etc. We repaired three tricuspid stenosis with commissure to me on caudal release as well, which is very uncommon, very rare. We failed in three cases of mitral repair where we had to go for replacement on the table. We are not afraid to show our own failures because I'm sure everyone knows that whatever you try to do, you will fail, face some of the failures as well. Though the copybook says the posterior leaflet prolapse is the most common, but in our cities, we had anterior leaflet prolapse more commonly reported, followed by posterior leaflet prolapse and some bileaflet prolapse as well. But interestingly, most of these anterior leaflet prolapses on the table, we found that it is actually pseudoprolapse. Most of these cases were actually type 3P2 PML, which is causing anterior reflect, which is not prolapsing, which actually is was pseudoprolapse. So a good number of caudal rupture was also found, but this was easy to repair. Caudal rupture, you just place a neocordy and correct the leaflet uh, defects, etc. Almost all the cases we had some caudal thickening where we needed to peel the peel off the corda, giving an impression that it was actually a rheumatic pathology to begin with. And most of the uh, tissues, most of the time that PML peeling was done because most of the cases PML was stiff and rigid, along with release of the secondary and basal cordy to make it type one. The AML tissue as well had some thickening most of the time in the distal third where peeling was not possible, but you could feel that the ML tissue is also shrunken so that a smaller size of the ring were actually used. In our series, almost 40 of the rings, 160 now, almost 40 of the rings were 28 size, followed by 36, 26 size ring, which is smaller by, by number. We had used a lot of 30 rings as well. Only eight rings, I can remember, we have used 32 size. So, our, uh, so far, we didn't have to go for re-intervention of any of our repair patients. It is almost seven years now. Some of our patients, not two, some of our patients are still having re uh, some regards. Two of them has two plus regards, but the regards volume is not large enough. We are following them up. One patient may require a redo surgery. Recently, I have so seen these things. Four of our patients had suffered CVD, as we had stopped anticoagulation. But uh, routinely now we close the LA auricle for these patients to avoid the chance of uh, CVDs. Two of our patients had actually given birth to patients, uh, babies, without any complication. Most of them are in regular follow-up. Follow-up is actually a real problem in this part of the world where it is difficult to keep track of the, all the patients. Some of our TP, T, tricuspid repair patients also failed uh, to some degree. One, one was a severe tear. And these cases, we didn't have a tricuspid ring. Uh, you couldn't use tricuspid ring because of uh, cost issues. We use a technique that is popularized by... Can I have two minutes, please? Uh, oh. One minute, please. One minute more, please. Okay. I'll show you a simple video, what we do. We go for superior transeptal approach. We cut the LA roof and extend it by cutting the intertrial septum. Then we see the valve, test the valve.
Then we close the alloy auricle from inside. You can see the alloy of alloy auricle closed. Then we place three, tra uh, three traction switches, two in the uh, trigons, and one in the middle of the PML, P2 region. Expose the valve, analyze the valve. See here, it is anterior leaflet prolapse, but actually not anterior leaflet is prolapse. It is P2 uh, uh, posterior leaflet, which is thickened and retracted. We do the cordolysis. We peel the posterior leaflets. Then we test the defect is corrected. The leak is no longer there. Now you size the valve and put an enoplasty ring. And after putting the enoplasty ring, once the, once the procedure is completed, we do an ink test to see the, the height of cooptation depth. Cooptation height. Thank you. I must express my gratitude to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to be here. My gratitude to my head of the department for allowing us to do the repair work and continue to do what we are doing. To the Institute for providing us a good 3D TE support. And as well as ablation devices are here, we are going to use start using them now. I'm grateful to the cardiologist who gave us continuous support pre and post operative evaluation and our anesthesiologist for providing the trans paraoperative transesophageal echo support and my team members for their dedication and continuous support and to your audience for listening to me i know it was not easy thank you thank you sir thank you for your nice presentation any questions though your lack of time any questions or comments harun can i ask a question simple Light, please, now, light. <clears throat> mitral valve repair in our country, we started a little early also in this hospital. But ischemic MR, rheumatic MR, has been an issue of different uh, size. Regarding ischemic MR, uh, the posterior uh, annulus as it dilated. So without putting a ring, and uh, we had a, a long uh, st uh, uh, experience of putting a four centimeter Teflon felt, pushing the posterior uh, uh, annulus anteriorly gave us a very good result. You have any comment on it? Simple sir, question. this yeah. is a technique which was popularized by Shambhut Kumar, sir. Very low cost technique and also gives quite a good result. But uh, reproducibility of these things is actually is uh, difficult to prove. So uh, most of the centers now say that you put an annual plus ring. Because the patient who are going for ischemic is CABG surgery, they can afford the ring. So better to use a ring rather than <laughs> trying to do something else. And ischemic MR is a totally altogether different pathology. It's not just a leaflet and annulus pathology. It's a LV valve pathology. So you have to see the Interpapillary distance as well. So repair, whether repair is the best option or replacement is the best, best option is still a debate. But ischemic MR, this is why I have excluded ischemic MR from these studies. Yeah, that's, uh, that's very true. Small annulus, uh, uh, you know, MR sometimes mm. is difficult uh, to repair yeah. where you go for uh, mitral replacement. And that's uh, very painful. Yeah. In those cases, sometimes, you know, uh, four centimeters, as Professor Calafuri from Italy had mm. shown that technique to us yeah. in this hospital, and we started doing. Mm. Even uh, we continue when the patients are very poor. Thank so you. If we expose the mitral valve and if we approach, have the approach to the mitral valve to that level, then it is probably better to give, either use a smaller ring or replace it altogether. Thank you, sir. Now I uh, welcome our last speaker, but heavy OIT speaker, Dr. Shakil Purit from Cambridge University Hospital, UK. So his topic is aortic aneurysm surgery. 
Thanks to the organizer uh, for inviting me to do this presentation. Uh, this is the most dangerous time to give a talk when people are waiting for their lunch. I will try to make my presentation as brief as uh, possible. Fortunately, I'm going to present something on the AHA guideline on the aortic uh, disease uh, update on which we, the cardiologists and the cardiac surgeons, both agree on. So I'm going to discuss when to do the surgery, how to do the surgery, and what's coming, what's the future. So this is what the dimension of a normal aorta should look like. Anything which is above 36 millimeter is abnormal aorta, whatever the height, weight of the patient is. We know this famous slide from Yale University where they have shown that when the diameter exceeds six centimeter in ascending aorta or in descending aorta, it exceeds seven centimeter, the incidence of complications go up very high, as high as up to 20, 25%. So that's why the, the guidelines are based on those criteria. Now, if we look carefully, this is a slide from um, Michael Borger's group. You will see that uh, even in patients with bicuspid valve and aorta, which is more than 4.5 centimeter, the freedom from any kind of major composite outcome by which I mean aneurysm, dissection, death, et cetera, is only 43% in 15 years. So why is it? It's because when we look at that data before, we look at a very mixed group. We look at a group where there are patients with connective tissue disease, there are patients with non-syndromic disease, there are patients with uncontrolled hypertension, with family history of aortic disease, all kinds of problems. So you have to identify these patients and treat them separately. That's where the personalized medicine comes. We look at the guidelines, what the guidelines say. Till now, the guidelines say that if the patient has a bicuspid valve without any risk factor and they're asymptomatic, leave them alone until the aorta becomes 5.5 centimeter. If they have risk factors, reduce it to 5 centimeter. And the threshold for Marfan patients without any risk factor should be 5 centimeter. And patients with connective tissue disorder who have risk factors, it should be further reduced to 4.5 centimeter. And also, if the patient is having concomitant aortic valve surgery, especially in the presence of bicuspid aortic valve. Lois Ditz is a very bad condition, ehlers Donald syndrome. In these cases, you can even reduce the threshold to 4.2 centimeter. And obviously, height and body max index matters. What's different to the 2022 guideline? The major difference is in bicuspid aortic valve disease, even if the dimension is five centimeter and it's been discussed in a multidisciplinary team meeting, you should offer the patient surgery. Because if the surgery is done by a complex aortic team, the mortality is extremely low. Also, another thing is you need to look at the rate of growth. If the rate of growth is more than three millimeter for two consecutive years, or in one year it grows more than five millimeter, patient should be offered surgery because this is impending rupture and problem. And also you have to look at the aortic cross-sectional area. We get too much hung up on the diameter of the aorta, but the length of the aorta does matter. And if the length is high of the aorta, the volume increases. So that's where all these things come into play. Now, when, how do we decide to intervene? We look at the risk and the benefit. If the risk is high, we don't offer surgery to the patient. If the risk is low, benefit is much higher, we offer surgery to the patients. How do you manage these patients? First of all, you have to identify the patients who are at risk, patients who have family history, patients who have aortic aneurysm, those kind of things. Hypertension, uncontrolled hypertension is a very, very big problem, and you need to aggressively manage hypertension. In patients with uh, Marfan syndrome, losartan has been shown to have good effect in reducing stopping the increase in the size of the aneurysm and reducing the incidence of complications. Family is, is very important, especially if your first degree relative presents with aortic dissection under the age of 50. Under the age of 60 is also very important. And of course, as we have discussed, if the patient has known bicuspid aortic valve disease. This is a very nice diagram in the 2022 guideline where it clearly shows when you should offer genetic testing to a patient. Just in summary, if the patient is, patient's first degree relative is under 60 and has any history of aneurysm or there are any features of connective tissue disorder, you should do genetic testing to the patient. If the patient's relatives are genetically tested positive, they should be offered imaging 
at the first instance. And then if there's any dilatation of the aorta, they should be managed very aggressively and they should be plugged in to a um, aortic service. Why? Because we know these are the patients, most of these patients are genetically predisposed to have problems. They have a dilated aorta and then suddenly they something, do something which increases their blood pressure, like strenuous exercise or emotional challenges, things like that, the aorta ruptures or they get acute dissection. This is an interesting study from the Oxford Aortovascular Group. I mean, imagine this is a study from a very, very uh, posh part of the country from United Kingdom, where 56%, more than 56% of patients had hypertension, had a recorded blood pressure of 140 over 90. And more worryingly, for ever, around half of the patients had one blood pressure reading of 180, over 180. And not surprisingly, these patients rupture because it's very simple, it's Laplace law. The tension will depend, tension in the wall will depend on your radius and on the pressure. Now you can't do anything about the radius of the vessel, but what you can do is you can control the blood pressure much better in order to reduce this uh, complication. And be very careful of the bicuspid valve patients. We know the type one bicuspid is the commonest uh, pa um, patient group who have this problem and their incidence is quite high of uh, aortic complications. Now, what if the valve is normal, even whether it's bicuspid or tricuspid, depending on what part of the aorta is dilated, whether it's the ascending aorta or it's the root, you will see there will be some aortic regurgitation. If the aorta is a little bit dilated, there will be central regurg. If the aorta is uh, heavily dilated, root is dilated, there will be eccentric regurg. And if the aorta is heavily dilated along with the root dilatation, there will be free regurgitation. So these are all important to understand when you are surgically managing these patients. Now, let's start with the basics, because I know in Bangladesh, aortic surgery is not done much. So this is the simplest, easiest aortic surgery to do if you want to start doing aortic surgery, which is an ascending aorta replacement. In ascending aorta replacement, once you have done normal bypass, uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, you excise the ascending aorta, you size the valve, and it's really important that if you are preserving the valve because there is not much leak or mild aortic regurg, you size the valve because if the valve is say 25, you go three sizes up with the uh, with the graft. So this is a rough rule. Otherwise, you are going to distort the valve. Also, another thing is not to distort the valve. So what we do usually is we take a um, tissue valve sizer and then we mark it in three places so that the proportion of stitching is same because one thing you don't want is to is the patient to have an incompetent valve in a in a case where the valve was competent before you replace the ascending aorta and then of course there's a root replacement when the aorta is dilated if it's severe aortic stenosis you just do a modified bentel procedure however if the valve is structurally normal you can do either of these procedures, either a David procedure or a Yakub procedure. There are lots of other procedures which have been used. Uh, I mean, uh, Florida sleep occasionally is used. Pairs is a very popular procedure when the aorta is not very dilated and uh, it's been shown to have excellent results in patients when they're treated early and it has been done in UK. So when I was an SHO at Brompton, Professor John Pepper did the first case uh, of pairs. And when you look at the MRI and even at the post-mortem, one of the patients died because of other problems. Patient ended up having histopathology. And this pair, which is an external support, completely got incorporated into the aorta, which is, which is uh, amazing to see. Now, this is a complex slide. I don't want to go into the nitty gritty of it. The bottom line is, if you're doing a valve sparing root replacement, it's better to do a David procedure because that David procedure is going to cater for all the patients, say so your young patients, connective tissue patients, all patients, because it stabilizes not only the aortic root, also the aortic sinuses. Whereas if you do a Yakub procedure, the problem with Yakub procedure is it does not address the aortic root and the sinuses. So you have to do an annuloplasty. I mean, Professor Lansek uh, from Paris, he has shown his series where they have achieved excellent results by doing an anoplasty ring. And uh, you know, in the right hand, if you're doing a valve sparing route, when compared to a modified bentel procedure, outcome can even be better, both the short-term outcomes and the long-term outcomes. Finally, we come to a complex procedure, which is a, um, 
arch replacement. I mean, in my uh, last talk uh, in uh, the national conference uh, just one month back, I went into details about this. I'm not going to dwell too much on this. Monitoring is important. You need to have a pre-arch artery line, post-arch artery line, femoral artery line, central catheter, bladder temperature monitoring, nurse, and TOE. It's absolutely essential. And the temperature is cooled down to 25 degrees so that we can do the operation safely. Now, at 25 degrees, you can have a safe circulatory arrest of 10, 15 minutes. However, if you add cerebral perfusion, you can potentially increase that. An arch replacement normally takes around 30 to 40 minutes if it's a straightforward arch replacement. So what we do is in arch replacement, we deal with the proximal part of the heart. So if the patient needs a valve replacement, you do the valve replacement or root replacement, and then you put a clamp, you start putting warm blood through the heart. So the heart starts to beat. And when you see a normal ECG, you know that the heart is beating normally. There is no problem. There is no cardiac ischemia. So you can forget about the heart. Now you concentrate on the brain and the actual operation. So what you do is you excise the arch and then put warm, uh, put cold blood cardioplegia at 8 to 10 ml per kilo per minute through the right axillary line and also 300 to 500, 500 ml cold blood to the left axillary line, which supplies the end organ, and then put clamps on. And if the cerebral saturation reduces on one side with this, you can add a third line where you put something to the left, uh, left carotid artery, and that protects your brain. And then because we do a left axillary line, the vertebral artery supplies the spinal cord, and you get less incidence of spinal ischemia. By doing a frozen elephant trunk, a single stage procedure can be converted to a double uh, double stage procedure can be converted to a single stage procedure in most of the cases. And in our cities, we have done one of the largest cities, 180 cases of a frozen elephant trunk. The results are excellent. A little bit of look at the future. We started with the debranching, Sienna graft, frozen elephant trunk. Now total endovascular grafts are done. The nexus graft and other grafts are used in patients who are not suitable for surgery. And believe it or not, in Brazil, the first endobental was done. So the cardiologists are knocking on the door, which is probably uh, good for the patients. Um, I will just show, and normothermic arch replacement has also been uh, described. Some of, the, uh, some of the teams in uh, Italy and uh, Germany are doing that with good results. We haven't started that yet. Uh, just uh, finally, a little bit of video of an arch replacement where you can see you can get around the arch vessels most of the time before even going on bypass. And then you excise the ascending aorta. We try to do the anastomosis proximally. So we do it around zone zero, which is before the innominate artery. And then you deploy the uh, Toraflex hybrid graft. I think it got FDA approval only recently. Uh, from June in states, it has been used. Before that, it was used only as part of trial. It's a very nice graft. It has a distal stent graft, which sort of uh, makes anastomosis extremely hemostatic. And it's very easy to deploy. And once you have deployed it, what you do is you attach the head neck vessels one after another. For the left axillary artery, we do extra anatomical bypass, which makes the operation extremely, extremely easy. So the final take home message is uh, aortic surgery is actually teamwork. You have to develop a very good team where you have cardiologists, you have cardiac surgeons, you have psychiatrists, you have neurologists, you have vascular surgeons, and patient is in the center of this care, and personalized, personalized medicine should be delivered to these patients. One size doesn't fit all, so you have to tailor the operation according to the patient. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your brilliant presentation. So, comments from our CR persons? No, I'm, I think it is an excellent presentation, very informative and a lot of things to learn from him. Basically, he is very true that uh, in this particular area of cardiac surgery, we are much behind uh, we, uh, as we started. So, uh, what to ask you? I mean, I have one question, okay? <laughs> question is, is, 37 years old, male, uh, having a bicuspid aortic valve, severe AR, and aorta is dilated 
say 40 centimeter 40, 40. okay so what is your plan so which part of the aorta ascending, ascending aorta. aorta i'm sorry ascending aorta what's the patient's size it's, it's important i think if if it's a very short patient no tall patient tall as you if it's a tall patient if you go strictly by the guidelines you ideally should not replace the ascending aorta you should just uh, do an aortic valve replacement but during operation if the tissue looks pretty fragile and bad i don't think anyone will uh, you know uh, criticize you if you do the operation now for the interest of time i couldn't show all the slides we if understand. you look at the paper from laurent dikarkov and uh, and uh, the french surgeon um, lansac if the aorta is between 40 to 45 at the sinuses you can do something about it you can do a, a sort of a david procedure but if your root is normal the ascending aorta is only 40 isolated and that severe air i wouldn't probably do the ascending aorta replacement i mean i don't know what the other surgeons think because you are risking yourself for being criticized if there's any any disaster in the theater i mean would you do a would you do a aorta, ascending aorta replacement with an aorta of 40, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. Okay, thank you. Any ask, I mean, uh, Prasant? But in case of actually family history of aortic dissection or known case of connective tissue disorder, at that time, if primary surgery is indicated for aortic valve, you yeah. may consider at that time for the ascending aorta replacement. I mean, even, even there, if, if the patient has connective tissue and the uh, patient's height is not very low, probably I wouldn't. I mean, um, but uh, some, 40, 40 some is school, way down. Some school says yeah, like that. I mean, if you look at the guideline, it's actually still a 2B, uh, uh, 2B indication. So I, I think you are opening yourselves to criticism and problems if anything goes wrong but with this patient. Some school always says like that. If you open for different indications, yeah. say aortic valve uh, should be approached, then intracardiac aorta may be considered to be replaced if known marfan or known family history of dissection is yeah so there it's a, in that case it's 45 uh, and if it's a lois ditz it's 42 so you know in those situations sometimes we do aortoplasty so you make like a oblique cut and take big sutures you can reduce half centimeter by half centimeter in a reduced setting if the aorta dilates the risk of rupture is far less than you'd have in a virgin chest uh, thank you thank you so, very good presentation. Thank you. Now, case presentation. I request our uh, yes, all okay. speakers yes, to yes. take your uh, case, Arun. please, from our chairperson. I request uh, Professor Frank Silke, sir. Dr. Shakil Furid. Professor Kamrul Islam Talukdar. Dr. Asha Bulak Siam and Dr. Hanun Roshit Chaudhuri. Come to come to come to come to come to come to